We have run out of material. The Douglas fir is very poor as far as plywood goes, and they keep downgrading these species as far as uh, you know how it, how it should be and uh, keep. Um, so we did quite a long time ago. We went strictly, pretty much strictly, to uh, uh, European panels from uh, African mahoganies. That's what my boat's made of here. That was Ray Heater with some insider info on the struggle of getting local wood. Another great one in the Drift Boat series today on the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. Hey, how's it going today? Thanks for stopping by the Fly Fishing Show. Before we get started, if you get a chance uh, and you haven't already, please click subscribe in your app of choice or at the website to get updated when the next episode drops. Ray Heater, the founder of Ray's River Dories, is here to share the background on the wooden drift boat uh, and the company he created. We get more history on the wooden drift boat, find out why Ray loves his rapid Robert style boat, and then cover a few tips on what to be thinking about to protect your boat uh, for the long term. Before we get started, let's hear from our sponsors. Sawyer offers a full line of modern and traditional products for oarsmen, canoeists, kayakers, and paddlers from all genres, providing unsurpassed function, performance, and beauty. The Sawyer Artisan Oar is their very popular square top oar with carbon fiber X weave fiberglass shaft reinforcement, featuring prints of fish species from artists around the country, passionate about fisheries and fishing art. These oars showcase Sawyer's and the artist's ability to create rugged yet highly functional art. Head over to wetflyswing.com slash Sawyer to grab your set today. I'm also happy to share another great sponsor we have with us this year. OPST's rods represent decades of dedication to sustained anchor two-handed casting. A rod reflects its designer, and these rods are a true illustration of Skagit Master Ed Ward's vision. The Micro Series uh, from 3 to 5 weight comes exceptionally close to single-handed specs and is proving to be a unique tool for trout and smallmouth anglers. Head over to wetflyswing.com slash OPST to check out the lineup right now. That's wetflyswing.com slash O-P-S-T. So without further ado, here is Ray Heater from Ray's River Dories. Uh, how's it going, Ray? Good morning. Good morning. This is very nice on this side of the mountains. So uh, we have sunshine today again, which oh, is yeah. very common here. You know, that's why I live here now, having been raised on the west side and uh, spent most of my life over there. But I like it drier. Yeah. It's colder. It's colder, but it's drier here. Yeah, and you're, and you're talking, I'm guessing now, I don't know exactly, but are you talking about Bend? I am. I'm sorry, Ben. On yeah. that, right? Yeah, yeah it's. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, we have uh, we have li- listeners all around uh, the country and all over the world now. So a lot of people might not know exactly where where Ben is. Oh ben yeah, is. actually, ben, ben being the central portion of Oregon, right in the middle. So anywhere from Bend within the state is equal distance. So um, oh wow. You know, so you can get two. The coast, the same amount of time as you can get to uh, the far west, uh, eastern desert, and so on. It's uh, and I explore all of this stuff. It's a, I'm I'm big on travel in Oregon, so that's right. And the pandemic hasn't uh, s- uh, slowed me down. Oh, good, at all. good, good. I yeah, uh, yeah. I think I saw one of your. I don't know how long ago it was, but I think Grant Grant McComey, Grant's getaways. You were on there about on his travel <laughs> Oregon. That was a. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> pretty, pretty good. Thing. It's interesting with the rain thing because I, I actually talk a lot about it because we're all on the west side and, and it's been raining a lot lately. And we're, yeah. we, we've always been thinking like, OK, when are we going to move over to the desert and get out of this stuff? And we're, we haven't done it yet. So maybe I'll follow your, your path down the line. Um, so yeah, today I I was hoping uh, Ray, I mean, obviously Ray's river dories is, is a company when you think of wood drift boats, especially in Oregon, uh, you know, your name comes up and the company you built. So we're going to dig into all that, but, uh, I know you have a background in fishing too. Can you talk about how you first got into, um, I'm not sure. Is it, is fly fishing? Were you more fly fishing or conventional fishing? Uh, both, uh, earlier in my career, I was, you know, raised right along 
the Salmon River at the coast, which is uh, empties near uh, Lincoln City on the ocean there. Um, the Salmon River. It's a small river, but uh, I would uh, go over there and start fishing. We had really big runs back in those days. It, we're talking the 40s and the 50s. And um, we had big runs of uh, particularly salmon because I remember us going, I didn't do too much steelhead fishing because I didn't have the knowledge and uh, I was the only member of the family that really fished, um, you know, early in my life. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so I, I grew up really enjoying the flow of the river, checking it out. And I was fortunate to have had a couple of mentors. Uh, they were people of some uh, knowledge and, and notoriety. Uh, Francis Ames wrote uh, Fishing the Oregon Country. And he and Fred Huffman, uh, owner of a small business there on the Salmon River, took us boys in. And there was only, being out in the country, there was only a couple of us boys. They took us in and taught us how to steelhead fish. And I really, really learned a lot from those guys. And it was really sweet. And I got to know the Salmon River very well. Wow. So I was spoiled, really spoiled in those days. But this was all gear fishing. We, yeah. I didn't learn to steelhead fish particularly until about the age of 40. Yep. And, and my introduction to it was primarily through uh, Marty Sherman and Joyce, his wife, and Daphne and I learned a lot with them and had a great time uh, absorbing all the techniques to steel, steelhead fly fishing. And that's I, I still do both. I gear fish and steelhead fish mm -hmm. or uh, fly fish. Well, so that gives us a little a rundown on your fishing background. The the definitely the big thing I want to touch on is the boat building. So how do you how do you go from uh, you know from back take us back to before you knew anything about having a boat company to how did the Raised River Dory all come to be? Okay, uh, just quickly uh, as a young fellow on the Salmon River, I I would launch off with small. Uh, you know, uh, G.I. Joe rafts and stuff. And, and I learned the art of rowing and floating down a river. And, of course, my brother and I did things that my mom never knew about as far as yeah. <laughs> floating the river. So I, I gained experience by looking at uh, water flows and knowing what, how to descend a river. But I never, and I always admired in those days, we didn't have any aluminum or fiberglass boats. Uh, we had drift boats. And interestingly, uh, another stream that I later uh, went on was the Nestucker River. Mm -hmm. And along the Nestucker River, there was a sweet place called Camp 101. And it was uh, kind of a, a bar, a dinner place, and a, a sporting goods outlet. And they also um, rented thrift boats, of all oh, wow. things. They rented them, and they, they had a boat slide right there. It was on Highway 101, but they it was like a private slide. And they would rent wooden uh, uh, McKinsey, Rapid Robert, actually. It was known as Rapid Roberts. And uh, that name kind of confuses people. And a lot of people don't really understand the boat. But it, it was part of the evolution of the uh, river drift boat. So um, yep. that's, the one, that's the one that I originally was influenced by. And quite frankly, after all the years of building boats and everything else, it's still my favorite boat. And I still... Uh, it's the one I retired with is a, a 14, I call it a McKinsey, a Rapid Robert boat. Yeah, Rapid Robert. And I, and we, uh, Roger uh, Fletcher talked about that boat a little bit. And actually, Joe Koffler did too, because I think that boat uh, you can get up on, uh, you can use a motor with, right? Yeah, it's a, it's a great all-around boat. And the reason I've always preferred it because uh, actually – all right. For one thing, it takes a little more skill to run really uh, risky whitewater yeah. with it. And I like that challenge. Uh, and also the fact that I can put a motor on it and take it in the base and, and um, 
gosh, it's just, it's the boat that's perfect for bend over here. But unfortunately, most of the younger people now don't understand what the boat is. It, it confused me as to why other boat builders of aluminum fiberglass never really understood the boat and they never got into it particularly. There, there were some attempts, but fortunately it kind of saved my business because I, um, I offered quite a different alternative in that respect. Hmm. Okay. So, so let's go back to the Nestucca drift boat. So do you know what wooden drift boats those were uh, that they were, they were uh, renting out? You know, that's a good question. I never thought to ask. Yeah. Uh, who who had made those boats? I for the life of me, I have yeah. never been asked that. What year was that when when you were doing that? Oh, it would have been. Let's see, it would have been just roughly about uh, early fifties. Oh, oh, wow, like yeah, yeah, that. yeah. So, so, yeah. So, this is good. Yeah. I'm, essentially, you you were using these boats, and then you basically at some point you said, uh, "I'm going to start making my own boat." It took my marriage to my wife here, Daphne, in 1973, and uh, both of us loved to fish. She was a good steelhead fisherman, gear and or fly, mm -hmm. and she was enthusiastic. And so for, uh, let's say, for our wedding gift, we gave ourselves a drift boat. Now, the interesting part about this was there was a fellow in Oretown. Oretown's a small place on the Little Nest Tucker River. Consists mostly at one time just a grocery store and a gas station maybe, yep. or a post office, and a cheese factory. Huh. And Tillamook Cheese had various factories in the small communities around, which they slowly, you know, uh, closed up and combined operations in Tillamook. So there existed a cheese, empty cheese factory in Oretown. This is 1973. And there was a fellow by the name of Carl. Uh, I don't remember his last name, but he called himself Oretown Marine. And he was building this Rapid Robert. And I, I, was, in, I was just thrilled to see this going on. And he was building not so much what you would call a wood one, but similar to a wood one, okay? Hmm. Yeah, interesting concept. He had a mold that he built and placed balsa blocks on uh, fiberglass scrim, and then he shot uh, polyester resin with uh, fiberglass uh, matrix and created this boat. And it was, <laughs> it was lightweight. It looked to be, quote, maintenance-free. Mm -hmm. And gosh, he had Honduras mahogany gunnels and bronze bolts. And oh my God, I, this is incredible. Here's a really light boat, and I can take it out, and uh, we'll use it and fish it and not have to maintain it, okay? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no kidding. <laughs> well, within a couple of seasons... The chine area, the area joins the side and the bottom. In this case, it was rather sharply constructed, sharply. You know, it wasn't really a piece of wood there. It was just these balsa core blocks. And once they got hit rocks enough, you guessed it, water penetrated the balsa blocks and made it twice as heavy as it was. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> the great idea of that. Oh, my. But anyway, the uh, the boat was was a perfect example of what I wanted in design. And then not, it didn't last too long. Carl died of a heart attack, and they just def you know the business went away. Yeah. And, and frankly, I think most of his business was doing uh, fiberglass shooting of uh, Pacific City dories. Oh, yeah. Pretty much. Yeah, there was a lot of that, which, uh, once again, I don't think it was very successful. But anyway, he passed on, and, and the thing closed up. So I took, and that's where I got my idea for the Rapid Robert. Right off this boat, I took the lines off, and I don't, I'll, I'll, you know, yep. that's that was it. 
And I started with that boat and then branched out to others and so on. Oh, gotcha. So you started with yeah. the, the Rapid Robert. and uh... I started with the Rapid Robert. Uh, my heart has always been in it. And it's the only boat. Huh. And I have run stuff even like the north fork of the Nahalem in those Rapid Roberts. That's interesting. Well, and for anybody listening that doesn't know what a Rapid Robert is, I could – Basically, yeah. it's it's kind of when you think of it, there's these boats out of, uh, well, even Coffler makes them here, but there's they're making these boats called a river skiffs. And, and they're not they're not a rapid Robert, but they look similar. They got the fr- they got the flat front end and back end. Uh, and is the rapid maybe just describe quickly what the rapid Robert looks like and how it's different from a normal drift boat. OK. Imagine. You know, these rentals of in the past in flat water lakes and so on. Key Steel made some rowing boats for uh, Clear Lake up there uh, on the upper end uh-huh. of McKinsey. And they're simply a rowing boat in which the operator rows for propulsion in this case. And he has a pointed end behind him, which is the bow. And he just, and then there's a wide transom to accept the motor possibly. And uh, so the Rapid Robert evolved from this style. And the earliest guys, well, not the earliest quite, but at some point, uh, in the, particularly in the 30s and so on, they used Rapid Roberts, like Vilty Pruitt and those yeah. guys used Rapid oh, Roberts. Oh, those were Rapid Pruitt. Roberts. Vilty was using Rapid they Roberts. Were, oh, yeah. Earlier than that, there were these river drivers, as, Rob, as uh, Roger describes, the, yep. which was kind of an influence, particularly on the Rogue and so on, for log driving from back in Maine and so on. You know, So the evolution of the boat still had influence clear out almost worldwide. And it was adapted by these enterprising guys from the McKenzie River. They started this rapid Robert, and then Woody Hinman followed it. And with my understanding is that he changed the design after one or two trips on the middle fork of the salmon because he felt like he, the, the, the waves were too big and he needed to get something that wouldn't stall with that wide yeah. uh, stern. So he enclosed the stern to a point, and now we have a boat that's shaped like a, a, a aspen leaf or a leaf, yep. you know. Pointed on both ends. So the double ender, that, right? Yep, the double ender, and uh, it's a pretty little boat, and uh, you know it's. Uh, but nevertheless, that big pointed end is not the bow. No, Keith Steele also in, indicated that. I remember Keith Steele. I met him several times, and uh, he says, "Nope, that is not the bow. The bow is behind the oarsman." Mm-hmm. So the oarsman is the only boat I know now in which you mount a motor on the bow. <laughs> yeah. That, that, yeah. That's it. So that, that clarifies a little bit there on the um, the Rapid Robert the, and the, kind of getting into the history there. So, And then when did you uh, – so how many of the, the Rapid Roberts did you make for to, to sell? And then when did you start making mostly just the drift boat, the, the McKenzie-style boats? Um, I made this, well, I, I, okay, beyond that, I was interested in, in designs and thought, well, I'll try uh, something that has a, a kind of a pointed on both ends. So my next move was I went up to uh, East Side Boats in Duval, Washington, and I bought one of their boat kits. And it was an interesting concept for a kit because he created a boat design that had the chine, which is the the, the uh, uh, member that uh, puts together the bottom and the side. And the chine was on, placed on the outside of the craft rather than the inside. And it was quite easy to build because you didn't have to deal with all the intricate chine notching in every frame member. And that was kind of interesting. I did that one time. Uh, put that together, and then I kind of let it lay there. And then the next thing I know, I'm um, let's see what did. I, oh yeah, uh, then I uh, purchased from Key Steel, and I was very proud to be part of that part. He, uh, I got a boat from him, and Key Steel on the Mackenzie River had 
a lovely amount of material and workmanship in that boat. It was mm-hmm. wonderful. And uh, the only thing about it is that it was, you know, you had to maintain it a lot. And unfortunately, this was before epoxy became really known out here yeah. in the Northwest. And if Keith had adapted some epoxy and cloth to these boats, they'd still be around and they'd be beautiful. Now, my, I know that Steve Steele, his son, yeah. lives in, in Lebanon, and occasionally Steve still builds his dad's boat. And I don't know how much more material he has, but he, I know he had a lot of really wonderful material. And I really got I really got to know and like Steve. Mm-hmm. And he would ask me often, well, what about this epoxy thing? And I said, Steve, you've really got to adopt epoxy and cloth on fur plywood so it doesn't weather check. And your boat will be around for years, hmm. you know. But uh, I don't know where that went. Yeah. Uh, on occasion, I see him. On occasion, uh, Steve. But, um, yeah. you know, I really hope he's done something like that. I did talk to Steve uh, recently. He's uh, oh, we're gonna, good. Yeah, yeah. I think we're going to try to get him on the show to tell the tell the Keith Steele kind of story oh, yeah. part of it. But um, so I, I want to check. So the epoxy, I mean, j- and let's just talk about your current. So take us to say. Yeah. Yeah. Say early '90s when you're making some of the the Ray's River Dory boats, which are your standard drift boats. Were those um, just standard wood, or did they have epoxy and cloth on them? Uh, well, they were standard wood up until gee, I can't remember when I adapted to epoxy and cloth. Uh, okay, so you did add I, it though. You added it. It, it, it took. Well, I would say I was probably doing it ten years before I went around to it. And, and, uh, and 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 incidentally, with with some exception, I almost insisted on the wooden boats that you do this epoxy cloth finish on the outside and oil the interior. Yeah, it's you know you can do the epoxy cloth on the interior. I mean it's easily doable, but it's also a fishing craft in which you want to kind of enjoy using and not worry too much and most of the wear of these boats comes on the inside of the boat and oil is excellent and we've gone through a variety of types of oil and kind of arrived at something we like Mm -hmm. uh, that works well for us oiling is definitely definitely needed on on these kind of wooden boats uh, on the inside oh okay so you have to oil and i and I guess I'm just trying to, you know, paint the picture here. And and my dad had, my dad had, and this is my connection to you. My dad uh, bought a boat from you. I think it was in the, maybe the late '80s, early '90s. And, yeah. Uh, and we still have that boat. You know, it's been, uh, you know, it, it's uh, it's been an amazing boat. Um, and I'm just trying to get a feel for if that boat, if it was purchased in the, say, the early '90s, would that be a, a boat with the uh, just wood, or was there epoxy mixed in there? There's very likely was epoxy, uh, definitely on the exterior. Yeah. And again, again, if it's fur plywood, which it probably was, if it's fur plywood, it should have been glass cloth with like four ounce cloth, because you can you can still see through and almost not see the cloth at all. And it's imperative that you do it on fur plywood, oh, otherwise. Wow. And don't do epoxy resin only on fur plywood because that will not work. It'll create more headache for you. You've got to have that very lightweight glass cloth to keep from uh, checking. Gotcha. Okay. All right. No, this is good. And I, I want to just check back on you know, the history and kind of do the quick little summary. So probably from the early 90s. All the way up, all the way up into. I mean, I don't know. When did you? When did you sell? When did you kind of get out of the business? Okay, I, I sold the business to Cyrus on the year that we moved to Bend, which hasn't been that far back, probably six years ago. Oh, yeah. So, so 20, 2014. So, yeah. So, there was 25 years there where you were going strong or, or yeah. more. Yeah. And my design of the what I called the road boat, because I had to kind of give a different name to the particular styles that were entirely different, um, the road boat. 
And I got to know uh, briefly uh, Bob Pritchett down on the Rogue River. Yep. And he had tweaked the, the quote, double vendor uh, and, and put a motor on the bow, uh, a transom in the, in the bow. And his boat was rather unique in that it had a really long flat spot on the bottom. And he had created that to uh, make the boat uh, perform a little better with the motor. As you know, the Rogue River has long periods of flat water, sort of. And he would use this motor to go between the rapids, you know, going downstream to proceed faster. It was one of the reasons he made that flat spot to create. Plus, yeah. flat spot is quite interesting. And I duplicated some of that in my uh, Rogue River designs. Um, being uh, really flat, they actually have less full body uh, rocker. And in that respect, when you row, they'll actually back ferry and hold better than a full rocker boat. And I thought that was pretty unique and pretty good. It did make them a little slower to respond laterally in movements in white water. But overall, it, I, I preferred that method. And uh, that, uh -huh. that's what made my rogue style boats a little different. Let's take a quick break for a word from our sponsors. OPST's rods represent decades of dedication to sustained anchor two-handed casting. A rod reflects its designer, and these rods are a true illustration of Skagit Master Ed Ward's vision. The Pure Skagit series falls right in line with OPST's principles, a short, medium, fast-action rod that sports an extra-sensitive tip, all while maintaining a powerful lower section that's true and sure to leave you impressed by its feather-launching potential. And I've been using this rod for steelhead uh, lately and been blown away by its lightweight and, and the power it packs. You almost don't realize it's in your hand. It's Seriously, it's like um, it's ultralight. So that was, you know, thinking about how to describe this thing. I think that's the word that comes back to me. Uh, I was casting some big flies for steelhead with a sink tip and a bunch of wind. And I didn't have a problem at all, even with my less than perfect uh, casting technique. So... I've been impressed with the 11 foot 7 weight, but there is a huge uh, line. They have uh, three different rods in the lineup uh, from 6 to uh, 9 weights and from 10 foot 8 inch all the way up to 12 foot 3 inch, which pretty much for me covers, covers it all. So um, I'm excited, excited to dig into more of this. Uh, these rods actually diverge from the micro series in a few ways. The upper grips are double weld and thus aligned uh, for the contemporary two handed rods. Uh, while the lower handle still remains switch style. Uh, these rods are also slightly faster than mi the micro series, being a true medium fast action that utilizes the upper third of the rod. Targeted towards fishing large trout and up to Canadian and Alaskan king salmon, this series should cover all the bases when targeting those larger fish. Head over to wetflyswing.com slash OPST to check out the lineup right now. That's wetflyswing.com slash OPST. Sawyer offers a full line of modern and traditional products for oarsmen, canoeists, kayakers, surfers, and paddlers of all genres, providing unsurpassed function, performance, and beauty. They design and handcraft every product in the USA, ensuring everything they make is from the highest quality materials with careful attention to detail. They take pride in their employees, stewardship of the environment, and our country. In return, you have the assurance of knowing the product you receive from them is genuine, made in America, and cannot be replicated. I've been using Sawyer products for a long time now, which is why I'm definitely excited to share them with you on the podcast here. I've been down some crazy technical whitewater and uh, mini fishing adventures that put me in places that were um, where I had to make a good move. And I, I love the design, the power, the performance, and always knowing that um, I can count on that stroke, even when you need to make you know that one to get past the rock or whatever. You can always count on Sawyer for that. And you can count on them as well. Sawyer products are designed by paddlers, oarsmen, and surfers alike to fully meet your performance needs. Pick up one today and experience the feel of water. Head over to wetflyswing.com slash Sawyer to grab your set today. That's Sawyer, S-A-W-Y-E-R, wetflyswing.com slash Sawyer to get started. Okay, back to the show. 
So no, I, hey, Ray, I love that you uh, got into uh, the McKenzie versus Rogue style because that's a big thing we've talked about here. I've had, um, we've talked about some of those Grand Canyon dories, and we've talked about the whole yeah, yeah. Uh, Martin Linton story and everything. So I'm curious because I think I always thought of your boats as mostly uh, McKenzie style, but is, did you make a, a, as many uh, of the Rogue style boats? I made it. Probably three quarters of my boats were the rogue style. Oh, wow. It's because people uh, perceive that big pointed end downstream is the thing. And or, over here in Bend today, I see nothing but that style of boat here. I call them banana style boats. but And they use them on flat water and all that stuff. And that's, I go, you know. If they only knew, but I, I don't make it. And what do you mean by I banana style? Them. What what do you mean? But what what boat is that? The, is that the Mackenzie or the Rogue the uh, Rogue style? What I call the Rogue style it has a full body rocker shape, kind of like everything that's uh, being made pretty much everywhere. The, the uh, aluminum and fiberglass oh, okay. boats. Because I was thinking yeah. of it. I always think of it like. You know, basically, you go back to the history. You got the two style of, of the present drift boats. You know, not talking about rapid mm-hmm. robbers, but you got the Mackenzie style, which is pretty much like a full rocker. Then you have the Rogue style, which were the boats that were made yeah. for the Grand Canyon, the Rogue, which have that flat section in the middle, right? And yeah. and ju- so yeah. your boats, your Ray's River Dory, like the boat that my dad has, that one is, does that have a flat section in the middle, or is that a full rocker? Well, if it. Uh, 16 yeah. uh, what we termed a rogue boat then it had a kind of a flat spot if you set it down on a concrete you can floor see and tried to release it to rock it wanted to kind of just It'll sit there oh it. yeah yeah so i'll have to check that out i don't, I don't even remember because i always yeah, yeah i was assuming that most of your boats were mckenzie i didn't realize that they were mostly they were mostly rogue yeah. style. that's good yeah it's uh it's a matter of image it's uh image as we know sells well uh mm-hmm. <laughs> Sometimes over over uh, practicality. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I gotcha. I remember Bob Pritchett's boats were like seventeen. They had a four foot bottom. They had like oh my God, they had better than thirty degree side flare. They were really long. They had like six feet of dead flat spot on the bottom. They were really interesting boats and great rowing boats for that type. But they didn't respond laterally quickly either. You yeah, know, you have to know what you're doing. Yeah. And there, I, I really, I don't think I see those at all anymore. How is the Pritchard? How is that boat you just described different from, say, the typical uh, raised river dory boat you built? A uh, longer flat spot on the bottom and a little more flare to the sides. Oh, gotcha. So, so your boats basically that's the difference is your boat was maybe even almost a little mix between McKenzie and Rogue style where it wasn't. Yeah. yeah. Well, the bottom was. The bottom yeah, was. And then so. you didn't have as much flare, flare on the sides and it was your standard 16 by 48 typically, right? Yeah. 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 And then we, we got into uh, bigger boats to, uh, I think Cyrus probably has influenced me in this respect we we went to wider boats in fact i had a very very good customer in jackson hole wyoming uh, aj de rosa who only runs wooden boats and he has a ton of our stuff and um, <clears throat> he was the first to realize that the mckenzie my my rapid robert style boat had some real merit in their water because first of all much of what's out there in Wyoming, Montana, and so on, is not really wild white water like you find on the coast here in Middle Fork of the Salmon. And you get something that's, for its size, it, it has more carrying capacity. We're talking about my Rapid Robert. Mm-hmm. And, and it actually will float in shallower water due to the fact it doesn't have as much rocker to the bottom. And you have more uh, visibility that people have. Hmm. Um, and so AJ really took that up, and he loves the boat. In fact, way back, he and his wife were married in one of my boats on the no, Snake no kidding. River. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. I've I've heard of uh, I've heard of AJ Derosa. I've heard of that name before. I I haven't talked to him yet, but I think he's a pretty. Oh, he he's a good source. He he really oh, cool. is. He's got great stories. Yeah, I. In fact, he he called me up a uh, short time back and said he's coming over here very soon. I haven't seen him in a long time, and hopefully he's bringing his wife because Daphne and she really hit it yep. off. 
AJ has found one of my rapid Roberts for sale out here, and he's going to oh, pick wow. it up. <laughs> well, let's go back. I, I keep going back to this rapid Robert because I think it's such an important boat for you, and I don't totally understand it. But let, let's clarify again on – so you got your normal drift boats. A rapid robber has a rocker, but it also has a flat spot. Like when I talked to Koffler, he was on the show. I asked him – you know, can you get a can you get a drift boat up on plane? And he was like, "No, you can't. You have to have a flat uh, transitional flat area." So, does the Rapid yeah. Robert have yeah. have a flat, an actual like a jet sled jet flat bottom of the boat in the back? Not enough. It won't. It won't do that. Okay, I've put a ten horse motor. In fact, I was way back um, when the Coast Guard was interested in my business and certifying things. I put a 10 horse on it, you know, and it were rather surprised to see me be able to go up the Clackamas River with this 10 horse because I didn't have as deep a rocker. But there's still some rocker near that transom. You know, the transom is placed in, you know, it that boat has a recognized stern and the stern is that wide transom yeah. and that where the motor is hanging. And um, no, it's not that. I'm not creating a skiff there, you know, a skiff with a dead flat bottom and then, yeah. you know, a plane. So you're not planning, you're, you're not planning like a normal, like a jet sled. Would no, you? no. The closest, and it really wouldn't say planning, but the closest you can do with a boat like that, with the motor I'm talking about, yeah. is probably put a dole fin on it. And that kind of helps. And I used to run up the Sandy River with a boat like that. What's a, what's a dole fin? Uh, some attachment to the lower unit of your uh, outboard motor, and it's kind of got fins on it, you know. Oh, wow. It oh, helps yeah, yeah. It helps, it helps uh, it give it I don't power. know whether they're, yeah. Okay. I'm not using that kind of thing anymore. In fact, I sold my outboard. I kind of like either rolling or using electric to get me somewhere. I'm not gotcha. into outboard. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right, cool. We'll, we'll leave it uh, leave it there. I think the Rapid Robber is obviously there's uh, I'll put some more links in the show notes to some history there, but so I want to talk to you about Cyrus because he was obviously it sounds like a pretty influential person that you worked with. When, when did when did Cyrus come into the Rays River Dory story? Um, well, I kind of know him of Cyrus and slightly known Cyrus for a very long time prior when he was a river guide on the Deschutes. And he preferred wooden boats at that time, even. And um, then I would say we formed things up. He may know better than I do about this. Uh, about the time I moved out of my home shop and over to Multnomah, mm. uh, uh, Multnomah Street there, in 90, I think we did it in 90. In 90. And where were you now? Where was your shop when you moved it in '90? What, what on in Portland or in uh, where was that at? Yeah, no, it was def it was uh, directly in uh, northeast Portland. So, and like what? Just roughly, just give me a picture northeast, like on what street? Oh, eighty uh, fourth, just two blocks off eighty second and Fremont. Oh, eighty second and Fremont. Okay. I the house my wife and I bought in seventy three or four. Uh, had one of these old Model A type garages, you know. What's the Model A type garage? Well, it's it's like a, a door that kind of you know just two two doors and you open it up and it's just fits a Model A. Oh, gotcha. A, yeah, yeah, so I know what you're talking about. See, the house was built in thirty seven. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so you moved. So you actually moved your yourself, uh, your family there, and the business in, in the yeah. in the house, or yeah. was there a different shop? No, it was there, and uh, I I took all of the lumber that it stored. It had a daylight basement. It had a basement down, not daylight, but a basement, and I had a window access, and I shoveled all this fine lumber down there and stored it, and it was perfect in this full full open basement. And then the, the little garage, so to speak, um, I built one or two boats there, and then I decided, no, this isn't right. I've got to do something more than this. So I took a sledgehammer and, and b tore down the garage, just like it was like February <laughs> or so. And, nice. And I got permit, and I built as big a garage shop as they would allow on the property and proceeded to build you know, these boats until I think it was 90, 1990. 
And a fellow that was working for me at the time found this uh, shop space behind a um, auto parts place on Multnomah Street. And the shop space was obviously much bigger than what I was working out of and uh, had more uh, easier access and was more acceptable for business purposes. So gotcha. uh, that's when I moved. And that's when I tied up with Cyrus about that. Oh, okay. So that was in the and 90s. He, yeah. He has great skill. He was a, um, a fellow that repaired musical instruments. Um, he, you know, I mean, he was methodical and really good. And uh, we, we just did very well together as partners. I, Really appreciated him. Yeah, yeah. Really. Yeah, and he was with you. And yeah, now he's still, like you said, still there making boats um, with, uh, he's, he's basically David. keeping it going. Yeah, with David. Yeah, I, I have not personally uh, met David that I'm aware of. I think David said at one time when he was a boy, he came into the shop and so on. Um, and he emailed me not long back. And I responded and hopefully it was... Um, you know, it was a, a good response to him and encouraging to him. I think he left it in good hands because, um, in yeah. my experience, David's been really helpful. He's been the person that's been my point man on, um, you know, kind of connecting. And, and Cyrus obviously is these the brains behind the boat building, but he's a li- he's a little bit harder. He's a little, I think, a little more shy. He's harder to kind of get. He is. Yeah. He is. And and I was always aware of that. And we. Um, we used our space accordingly. I mean, I kind of, when a new customer came in, if Cyrus was working with him, I just stood back and, you know, in the same way, we were very respectful of each other. I, I just can't tell you how nice it was to have him as a partner. That's cool. He was really good. He was very yeah. good. So, so for the most part, throughout the 90s and, you know, for that 20-year period or whatever, mm-hmm. it was you and Cyrus. You were the two main people. Yeah. Well, I, I, I had another fellow that worked for me in promotion, uh, kind of part time for him, and gosh, he did he did very well for us, um, you know, getting the name out. He was from Michigan, and he was uh, ended up a lot of work went back there, and pretty soon work went, you know, all over, uh, not just the Northwest, but uh, and it was he did a very good job. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. That's cool. Okay. Um, I was just kind of thinking here, so I think we've covered a, a decent amount, um, you know, as far as the things I wanted to touch on. I was curious, you know, we had a question from the Facebook group, um, and this is, uh, let's see here. Oh, it's just about the favorite boat, you know. So so you talked about, um, <laughs> you've got, I think we've answered that, right? Is the, is the, uh, the that Rapid Robert is kind of your favorite style? The four, the fourteen foot. Okay. Yes. The, the that, fourteen footer. That's just perfect. I, I made them in sixteen also, and and eventually widened the bottom to fifty four on the sixteen footer. Uh, yeah. And okay. More for proportion. Yeah. And I make it. Uh, they made a twelve, but rarely. Yeah. Gotcha. So did you ever think while you're getting the 70, because I think in the early 70s is kind of when I think Coffler maybe was getting going. Did you ever think about uh, just getting into the aluminum or was it always, it was always going to be a wood thing? Uh, I never considered it yeah. anything. Yeah. Yeah, it was always, because it seems like for you, it seems like almost, I mean, there was Don Hill, I remember, you know, but it yeah. seems like you were like the only show in town. Were there other drift boat, like actual companies out there during throughout your, your well, time? Well, now that I've been six years away from it, I'm not very sure. I know Randy Dersham, who owns Eagle uh, Rock Resort on the McKenzie. Uh, I think he took over or bought out uh, Tatman, who Tatman bought out Hill and so on. And Randy had a, a nice little shop across the highway from his business, uh, a little boat shop. But that all burned oh, wow. this last fall, you know, all of that. Jeez. And I don't know that he was very involved in that at the time. Uh, so as far as who else does it, um, Steve Steele probably rarely. I don't know. Uh, the guys, there's a couple of guys that I really respect their work in Montana, uh, Sandy Pittendrow and Jason Cahoon. And they... Um, 
Yeah. They build stick and glue type boats and they're, they're gorgeous. And the, and the guys are really nice. I'm glad you brought that up, Ray. We're on the same track here because I just uh, interviewed uh, Jason uh, recently. Oh, did yeah, you? Yeah, and he talked because I was really interested. In my whole experience, you know, mainly because of you and other people, was was your style of boats. I didn't even know what stitch and glue was. Yeah. So, so Jason, I'll put a link in the show notes to that. But he talked about the whole stitch and glue, what it's about, you know, why. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I think it's really – I love – I mean, I'm doing this because I love the history and I love documenting the people that paved the way like yourself. And I think it's cool because there's not there's not just one way to do it, right? There's a whole bunch of ways to do it. Yeah, you know, there is. Yeah, there's nothing proprietary about it. The, the boat is rather simple. And uh, in my case, it was just a matter of what worked in flowing water, you know, and I just – and I love to fish. And what works in flowing water and go from there. Good. Well, I also want to check really quickly on tips. So if somebody has a wood boat, doesn't matter what it is, right? Say it's maybe it's one of your boats and, uh, you know, it's an older boat. What would be the tips to keep that thing going strong other than maybe keeping it in a garage? Is there any other thing you would recommend somebody to, to make sure it goes for another 20 years? Well, hopefully it started out being oiled in the inside. Oh, yeah, that's right, on the oil. And what is the oil? So is that a uh, – what type of oil is that? Well, eventually, after many experiments, and I don't feel like what we did was bad in any regard uh, as far as oil goes, but we settled on the simplicity of Daly's Sea Fin, which means Seattle finish, and you just – Haul the boat out on a, 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 provided it's cleaned out inside, haul it out on a warm day and just soak it on the inside. Oh. And I, I'm not talking about sanding it in. No. And make, just soak it, you know, until it won't take anymore. And then, by all means, dispose of the rags properly. Don't let it, yeah. don't let them, yeah. Don't, don't throw them in the Small. river. <laughs> <laughs> or, or even in your garbage, make sure that they um, evaporate before um, they become hazardous. Oh, okay, gotcha. So this is some. But, but that's so. I do that with this boat, and I kind of enjoy it. It doesn't take long, you know. You give it a bath for the, and then you uh, you give it a, a, a water bath first and clean it good, yeah. and then all it outwards. It'll warm up, and then. Lay the oil on her, and she's good for another year. Okay, so once a year, you got to do the oil. I believe so. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and then so oil it, keep it indoors. Any any other tips? Is that pretty much it? If you got a good boat, it'll be good to go. I mean, that old Rapid Robert you have, you haven't over the years done much else to it other than oil it. Yeah, uh, I built it in fourteen for myself, and I gave it a coat of varnish two seasons ago on the outside, just the outside. It was fun. It was easy. You just wet sand it with like 220 yep. keep it wet and and just go over the whole boat before you do anything else with the wet sand and it leaves like a like a looks like a paste oh yes yeah. residue of the epoxy you know and just then come back and wipe it all down with the wet cloth we're using microfiber cloths a mm -hmm. lot now and uh let that and then Roll on, always do two coats, two coats of varnish or paint or yeah. whatever, you know, always do two. But um, again, when the boat has been properly epoxied on the exterior and clothed on the exterior in the proper manner, uh, you probably don't need to do that uh, very often yeah. on the outside. Gotcha. That's, that's yep. more like every five yeah. or ten years or as needed or something like yeah, that. Yeah, that, that's probably right. Un yeah. Unless you were somebody, uh, I mean, you wouldn't want to leave these wood boats sitting outside, right? you got to keep them indoors. No, no. The thing that kills them is the sun. Oh, the sun, yeah. And, yeah, and uh, you need UV protectant over the epoxies, and that means paint or varnish. You don't just put epoxy on and think that's the end of it, because if you do nothing as far as UV protection, the sun will begin to degrade the epoxy. It'll turn it kind of whitish, and it'll never be the same. You'll have to paint it if you if you have a bright job. Oh, you know? yeah, you got to paint it. So you, you'll have to paint it if it degrades to that that's point. That's what that's what the paint does. Yeah. So so any of those boats you see that are just the the beautiful wood with no paint yeah. those ones have been taken care of if it's an older boat because it's yeah i got you well it's it, yeah you have to reapply the sunscreen so yeah, the sunscreen <laughs> the, the warning 
the varnish is just some oh screen. right um, okay yeah and that's just like yeah. a yeah just a marine grade varnish or something like that yeah there's lots of quote varnishes out there and many of them are don't do the job right so gotcha. it's really important to don't don't cut corners uh, don't buy something inexpensive uh, yeah you know it, it it only took a quart of varnish on my boat to do the two coats because i just roll it on tip it on it's it doesn't take much mm. yep yeah that's good okay uh well as we take it out of here uh just a couple of quick ones here so <clears throat> This is kind of uh, on the fishing. So if you, you, it sounds like you like rowing. So if you had to uh, pick between just just being a rowing a boat or fishing, what which one would you do? Which one do you like love more? You mean what style of boat? No, like uh, so. So you, it sounds like you do some fishing and you love rowing. If you if you kind of only could do one of one of those things, would it be more fishing or more more rowing? <laughs> <laughs> oh no, it's fishing. oh it is fishing. Okay, there you go. I I row I row to get to the fishing. Or so that's right yeah. that's right I'm, fond, I, I'm really fond of uh, fly fishing for trout and steelhead uh, but in the middle of the winter when the water's heavy and all the rest of it no I haven't adopted the uh, uh, spay fishing I'm still a single-handed fisherman yep. and uh, the winter fishing the change of all the different lead core lines and stuff like that it's it kind of turned me off i just yeah. if you want to do that go to gear and put on a fly and bounce yeah. along the bottom <laughs> yeah well you might you might check our sponsor one of our sponsors this year is uh, opst and they have some some new rods i'm testing out some spay rods i'm not a big oh, i'm yeah. not a big spay guy either i was always a single hand but now the oh. technology is so good these days yeah. i mean is that right? oh yeah it's amazing the rods you pick up they're they're almost lighter than the single-handed rods used to be you know what i mean oh my gosh so it's, maybe if you if you hook me up there then i'll be spending my money there you go i will <laughs> i'll hook you up <laughs> cool all right well i think um yeah i feel pretty good about this i you know i'm sure there's a few little little things we left but uh i i have a good feel for you know how you did it it sounds like you just loved building boats and you put together a company and 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 sold it right how did that feel when you sold sold your company was that a was that a pretty um because i guess you know some people don't always get the chance to sell their companies right yeah uh you know i've done it enough um and i i think all it took was uh, good friends over here and ben to keep nudging us to move over here plus uh where i was located eventually in my house was up out of uh sandy oh. and i had a really nice big shop up there Ooh, that was fun yeah. Uh, and then at that point, Cyrus was maintaining the shop in town, and I only came in like once a week. I stayed in the big shop and did the excess and did the boat kits. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah, and it was a great arrangement, and it, it, it could have continued on, but I had two things that made me change my mind about the, the position, about moving to Bend, and that was I had these friends that kept saying, come over here because they – I'd known them forever, and they were big fishermen and, and skiers. And the other one was we got a bad neighbor in that net. <laughs> oh, really? A really bad neighbor. Everybody up there thinks he's a bad neighbor. And we got where we couldn't live next oh, to him. What, what's, so. uh, just give us a little, what, what's a bad neighbor mean? Playing loud music or something like that? Oh, oh he just, um, uh, he had a complaint about everything. Oh, about, right. And it wasn't the fact that I was making noise and having a shop and all that. It wasn't that at all. It's just that he he can't seem to be get along with anybody. Anybody. I never saw, for twenty years. I never saw a person go there. He wouldn't allow people on his. Property. Oh, weird, weird. Yeah, yeah. It was awful. That's weird. Okay, so that and that was in what Sandy. So you had a shop in Sandy too, or or in Sandy on in Portland? Uh, no, it was uh, about ten miles out of Sandy, up uh, towards Welch's. Oh yeah, not far from. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it was up, a, it was a really neat location. It was a great house we had built and a smallish house, bigger shop. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I missed that. I missed the shop. Uh, living here in Bend, I wish I had a shop like oh, that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. God, yeah, yeah. I'm not even sure if there's anybody in Bend that are, that, I don't think there are any boat makers in Bend uh, that I've heard of. You know, there was somebody. Uh, yeah, the Diamondback uh, was there, uh, right, for a while? Or no? Uh, yeah, Mike Baker. And, and he did a very nice job. And I think he lived uh, north of the bend at, around Tumalo. But 
unfortunately, and I meant to, to, after having moved here, I thought I'd kind of go over and see him because he and I had met and talked before. And one day, unfortunately, in the obituaries locally, I noticed a Mike Baker. Mm. And I went, and I haven't heard anything about him. So I kind of figured that's yeah. the Mike Baker, you know, unfortunately. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. All right, Ray. Well, uh, yeah, I guess anything coming up for you? Are you just going to be doing some fishing in the next next six months or so? Uh, any Anything new for you? Oh, May. May and May over here in these rivers and Crane Prairie. Oh, my God. Oh, yeah. That's like it. Incredible. That's right. And you and that Rapid Robert is the perfect lake boat, isn't it? <laughs> Absolutely. That's right. Yeah. May, May is the month that race days. I tell my wife, do not make plans. Yeah. Race up there. Oh man, that's awesome. Yeah, I love I love Crane. Cool. Yeah, May is a hot month here. Good. It really Good. is. All right, Ray. Hey, I appreciate your time today. I'll put a link to your um uh contact there if people want to check in with you on anything but uh oh, sure. yeah, yeah i appreciate you taking the time today and uh all the great work over the years your your boat i can tell you to be honest yeah. that boat has taken out more fish and more deer over the years than any boat i've ever been in so it's <laughs> it's uh I, I should send you a photo of what it looks like when we had that thing overloaded probably yeah, the should. marine board would have given us a that. ticket for it but we loaded the crap out of that boat and it, it did awesome for us oh by all means do yeah keep me informed on that um are you as a fly fisherman are you using kind of you park your boat and then get out and wade fish or the water ahead is that what you do i do a little bit of everything i actually have uh well so that the, your old boat that you made for my dad he gave me that boat so i'm i'm in the process i'm hoping to connect with Cy and maybe maybe do some re yeah. refinishing of it but i also have a coffler a drift boat that i use okay. a lot and then yeah. i yeah well, they make nice boats. yeah, yeah. yeah the coffler well they, why do you think why yeah. do you think quickly before we get out of here why do you think there aren't more wooden drift boat companies we have run out of material. Oh, uh, no kidding. Well, I mean, you know, the Douglas fir is very poor as far as plywood goes. And they keep downgrading these species as far as, uh, you know, how it, how it should be. and keep. Yeah. Um, so so we did quite a long time ago. We went strictly, pretty much strictly to uh, uh, European panels oh, wow. from uh, African mahoganies. That's what my boat's made of here. Crazy. How ironic is that? The fact that we're in the Pacific Northwest and you can't even get... I know that's exactly right, but that's what's happened. Wow. You know, it's just my heart still goes out to Douglas fir uh, plywoods, but you absolutely can't find any stuff this worth. Crazy, crazy. You, know, you, you, have to, you have to spend the money on real expensive... Uh, uh, foreign-made panels that come out of uh, the wood comes from Africa, yeah. uh, Sepagli, and so on. And uh, that stuff is lovely. It's really, uh, that's that's it. That's why more people. That's it. If, if you want to do a project like this out of our native woods here, good luck oh, wow. because it's tough to get any good material. There you go. Well, that's a, that's a good tip. I'm glad you mentioned that. Uh... All right, Ray, well, I'll let you get out of here, and uh, thanks again, and I'll keep in touch, and uh, we'll, we'll kind of let you know when this all gets out there. So there you go. If you want to find all the show notes with all the links we covered, just go to wetflyswing.com slash 197. Again, please uh, subscribe if you haven't already to uh, get reminded when this next episode uh, is going to drop, and I want to take a look and let you know what the next episode is. And the next episode that we have coming up is uh, on uh, Stonefly. Stonefly Nets, one of our sponsors. So I'm excited to share that episode with Ethan. We talk about uh, the background on uh, kind of his company and, and nets in general. So it's a really good one. I hope you can uh, check that out. That's on Thursday. So uh, if you uh, want to get updated when that drops, just uh, click the subscribe button. That would be awesome. Uh, that's pretty much a wrap. That's all I have for you today. Uh, I want to thank you for stopping by today and checking out the show. I'm glad you stuck around till the end and hope to maybe see you uh, online or on the river. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com.